you to die to sin. Now, you can't claim the first and not claim the second. Because both of them are a result, as we're going to see, of his death, burial, and resurrection. If you got one and don't have the other, you really haven't experienced this death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, you cannot be saved, born again, a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things Knows that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, doesn't say all things are becoming new, they are new. See, we be trying to become something. We're becoming something. No, you are it. You are a new creature in Christ. You are not becoming a new creature in Christ. And that happened at the point that you identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It happened the day you got justified. But it's possible to come and sit in the chair. It's possible to get dunked in the water. It's possible to pray Jesus into your heart and none of this be your reality. Because that's not what makes it happen. Is anybody hearing me this morning? The legalist is trying to avoid the liberal view and protect the faith from the idea of freedom to sin because of grace, however, injected a just equally dangerous idea that salvation as well as spirituality, even for believers in Christ, is produced by conformity to external laws or rules. They're both wrong. Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the apostle avoided the extreme of legalism and libertarianism. A saving relationship with God is undeniably linked to holy living. You can't have one without the other. And a holy life is lived by the power of God working in and through the heart of the true believer. Paul was addressing the believer's occasional falling in sin, was not addressing the believer's occasional falling in sin. Christians do at times because of weakness and imperfection of their unredeemed flesh commit acts of sin. But as a lifestyle, to be characterized by it as habitual, no, certainly not. So secondly, grace does not need legalistic rules to produce holiness. Grace does not need legalistic rules to produce holiness. If you belong to Christ, if you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, if you have identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if you are his possession, you don't need law because you got the Spirit. Pastor Clay, can you prove that? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Starting with verse 24, 25, 20. Now we know verse 16 through 20, 21, 23, but we don't know 24, 25, 26. Are you there with me? Say amen. amen. And those who are Christ, notice the apostrophe? That means those who are his possession and those he is possessed by have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires at the point of justification. And listen to this. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not become what? Conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If you have the spirit regulating your life, you don't need law and rules. Because the spirit is always going to lead you to do what the law requires. See, the reason they got signposts out there on the streets and the highway is because they know you don't drive in the spirit. So you need law. You need law, you need signs posted to remind you this is the speed limit. But if you drove in the spirit, you wouldn't need them signs. You would never ever hear that sound that gives you a heart attack. Woo, 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 woo. Why? Because the Spirit would always lead you to obey the law. But you need rules because they know you still live in the flesh. 
See, people in the flesh need rules. People in the spirit don't need rules. And people who live in the spirit will never use grace as a license for sin. So anybody teaching that is a liar and the truth ain't in them. Anybody believing that is probably not saved. Because Paul's writing to contradict all that and more. That leads us to our second point, the reaction to the believer's liberation in Christ. Verse 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Now, you can't see it in your English, but let me give it to you in the Greek. No way, Jose. Not only is this stupid to think, it's impossible to do. See, that phrase means there's an impossibility of this. So if that's your reality, you're doing something that's not possible if you really are in Christ. Don't just tighten you up. Well, we're only human. It's impossible if you're in Christ. I don't care whether you're human or not. Well, I got weaknesses. It's impossible in Christ. I don't care about your weaknesses. Well, my mom or my daddy, where I was raised, what I didn't have, who I didn't marry, who I did marry, that's what's leading. It's impossible if you have identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not possible. And it's a ghastly thought for you to even think it. That's what that means. That's what that phrase says. It's a ghastly thought, not only to do it, it's a ghastly thought to even think that way. Amen. That somehow sin, your sinning and continuing in sin brings glory to God is a ghastly thought. Amen. And it's an impossibility. You know all that was in that, certainly not. You just, certainly not. Well, he just made it. it no, no, it means more than just no. <laughs> it's a ghastly thought to think that way. Shame on you. And it's an impossibility to do. This is sure enough to get me run up of most churches, would not it? But it's what the text means. See, this is what happens when we don't preach the Bible. We preach to people's experience. We lower it down to the level that they can handle it. No, you raise people up to the standard. You're not helping people by lying to them from the pulpit and watering the word down just because they don't live up to it. If this is what God meant, this is what God meant. Tell the folk what God meant. And then come out of the pulpit and say, now let's get a plan together to help you get where God meant. The Greek word is meneo, it means may it never be. How can a Christian who at one point in time in the past, second aorist tense in the Greek for Pastor Strong and those who understand Greek, die to sin, still, sin, still live in it. At one point in the past, at the cross, you died. That's what you're going to say later on in verse 3. You identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. At one point in time in the past, you died to sin and Christ died for your sin. How can you now live any longer in it? See, that's why you gotta have this more than death, burial, resurrection. You gotta understand what death, burial, resurrection was meant to produce. Paul argues that the believer has died to sin. He does not mean that our sin nature, our fleshy nature, has been removed or eliminated. That's not what he means. We all still have a remnant of flesh in us that still wants to sin, that still can be enticed by sin, that can still be drawn to sin. But here's the thing, you're dead to it. See, the sin 
flesh, that flesh. See, you're redeemed, you're a new creature in Christ, you're a new man, and the new man is being renewed day by day inwardly, but there is still that remnant of unredeemed flesh because God did not remove it from you. That happens at glorification. But that unredeemed flesh no longer has any legal authority over you because it's been stripped of dominating power. Therefore, the new man is more powerful than your unredeemed flesh. But it's not automatic. It's not automatic. Because he's going to say later on, your response is make sure you don't present yourself to some things. Don't present your members to some things. So it's not automatic. You got to make sure you're not presenting yourself to stuff you're supposed to be dead to. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. You want God to automatically autopilot you to obedience. <laughs> you want God to automatically levitate you to feeling good all the time. No, stop presenting your members to dead stuff. So now you gotta watch your TV habits. Now you gotta watch your music line. Now you gotta watch who you run around with. Now you gotta watch where you go. Now you gotta watch how you feel. Now you gotta control how you think because you gotta not present yourself. But the good news is you've been able, able to do that. When you were under the first Adam, you were not able to do that. Most of you who are truly saved are living in self-imposed bondage. Not because you have to, it's because you don't know how free you really are. And I don't know how you can go to dynamic life all these years and not know how free you are. Maybe it's because you don't have an ear to hear. Maybe because we sow in the seeds, but you got ground that is not conducive for growth. And so life and circumstances of life choke out the word, or the devil comes and takes the word, or the cares of the word, this world choke out the word, and therefore it can't get rooted and grow and be healthy and produce a healthy Christian life. You can't grow keeping your idols. You can't grow loving something else more than you love God. You can't grow loving yourself more than you love God. You can't grow until you surrender all. And there are things your flesh, that unredeemed part of you, want to hold on to. This world is conditioned to teach you and help you think and feel contrary to what God says. There are people who are still sons of disobedience who are perpetrating a Christian, fall, a Christian falsehood that you need to stop listening to and hanging out with. Or this will never be your reality. Indeed, as he said elsewhere, God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his son. He loves in Colossians 1.13. Having experienced such a transfer and transformation inwardly, how dare we go on living in habitual sin? Amen. Listen, listen, go back to it. It is not only what Christ has done for you, it is also what he has done to you. And you are not what you were before you identified with Jesus Christ. Donald Gray Barnhouse states it this way, holiness starts where justification finishes, and if holiness does not start, we have no right to suspect that justification started either. Justification produces sanctification, and sanctification gives evidence of justification. You can't have one without the other.
This idea refers not to the believer's ongoing daily struggle with sin, but to the one-time event completed in the past because we are in Christ. Look at verse 11 of chapter 6. There's just so much to teach here, so much to teach here. Go back, go back to verse 10. For the death we, that he died, he died to sin once for all. Who are we talking about? Jesus, Jesus right? Yes. Christ died once, right? Yes. He's not dying every day. Right. He died once in the past, for, right? Yes. But the life that he lives, he lives to who? God. God. Likewise. If it's true for A, it got to be true for B if B going to look like A. Amen. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves what? Dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, it'll never happen if you don't reckon yourself, count yourself, consider yourself to get your calculator up. When you add it all up, I am dead to sin and alive to God. then this will not be your reality, practically. Then it's questionably, questionable spiritually. Do you see the problem here? How do we have churches ranked and filled with sin if this is true? Yeah, I wanted to hang there for a minute. Because <laughs> we keep talking contrary to what God says. Right. Because if what God says is true and I look at my own life, it don't look like what God said, but I'm going to be saved no matter what God said. If God is the one that saves, how are you going to say something different than when God says if he's the one that saves? Right. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh. I can't control my mouth because you keep presenting yourself to stuff that won't let you control your mouth. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. There's a reason you got teeth. <laughs> See, most of us think we got teeth so we can eat food. No, they the gatekeepers for that thing that's behind them. They're supposed to keep it in. Your teeth are a cage for your tongue because James says your tongue can light a forest on fire. It needs a cage. See, it's hard for you to speak if you clamp your teeth down. Because then your tongue can't wag it. Uh -huh. I, can't, I just can't control my speech. No, you aren't controlling your speech. You've been able, able to do it. I just can't control my thoughts. No, you're not controlling your thoughts. You've been enabled to control your thoughts. The fact that you're being worn out by bad thoughts means you can concentrate. <laughs> it's just what do you concentrate on? See, you're not having any problem concentrating. That's why you're thinking about that sin all the time. You can focus. You just focus on the wrong. So it's never ability. I wish somebody was praying with me this morning. I'm just trying to free some folks. I'm just trying to free some folks. But you can't get free until you think right. Because we are in Christ, he died in our place. We are counted dead with him to sin. So if Christ died to sin and we're in him when he died to sin, then we too must be dead to sin. And if he's alive to God, if we are in him, then we too must be alive to so if this is not your reality, it ain't hard to figure out what the problem might be. Now, the other problem is you might not have known this, but now that you know, something needs to change. So you might not have heard this before. You might not have understood this passage that way before, but now that you've heard it, how now are you going to continue in your sin? Because when you look at verse 6, he says, knowing this, some people didn't know some things. But now that you know, 
not only intellectually, but by experience. See, this has to be your experience. This is supposed to be your reality. It will never be real to you just intellectually in your head. See, the devils know who God is. They don't serve him. Because they have intellectual knowledge, they don't have experiential knowledge and reality. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We've already quoted 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Not becoming, have become new. You are something that has never existed before. Amen. Therefore, the person who is alive in Christ has died to sin once and for all, and it's inconceivable and self-contradicting to propose that a believer can henceforth live in sin from which he was delivered by death. Only the most perverted logic could argue that continuing in sin from which he has supposedly been saved somehow honors the holy God who sacrifices his only son for sin. It's perverted logic to think that. It's a ghastly thought and it's an impossibility. That leads us to our third and final point, the reasoning. And this reason goes from verse 3 to verse 10, but I just want to introduce it this morning. We'll pick up on it next week. The reasoning for the believer's liberation in Christ. Look at verse 3. Or do you not know? There it is. Or do you not know? Going to church all your life and you don't know this stuff. Been saved for 20, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And you don't know. But look at what it says they don't know. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And his death was a death to what? Sin. So how can you have been baptized into his death and you not be dead to sin? Two things, two things here, two, two, two facts here. The unifo uniform affirmation of liberation in Christ. The uniform affirmation of liberation in Christ. Look at the verse with me again. Look at the verse 3 with me again. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus? The word baptized has nothing to do with water. Hold your finger here and turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10. This will give us an illustration of what this text really means. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. He says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. There's a lot of ignorance going on in the church, ain't there? That all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and all were what? baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Is he talking about Moses dunked all of them in the water? He's talking about what? That we have identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. The word, the thought is you have identified. They identified with Moses as they passed through under the cloud and through the Red Sea. This word here is used of a cloth maker who dyes cloths. So you have a white cloth. He may have a, a color red here, and color blue here, and a color green. And so he has a white cloth, and he would dip the cloth into the red dye, and now the cloth takes on the identity of the red dye. It identifies, it, it takes on that color red, yes. or green or blue. Yes. We were baptized into Christ's death. Okay. He's talking about identification. How do you identify with Christ and don't look anything like Christ? How do you identify with Christ and this was the purpose of his coming to die and his burial and his resurrection, but you don't look like you identify with any of it? 
If you were dipped into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and you come up out of that, shouldn't you look like? It's not talking about water baptism. You can go down a dry devil, come up a wet one. Amen. You're not talking about sitting in a chair. You can sit in the chair unsaved and get up and leave unsaved. But you cannot be dipped into Christ and come out unsaved. You cannot be dipped into Christ and not come out transformed. You cannot be dipped into Christ and not be transferred from one realm of dominion to another realm of dominion. You cannot be dipped in Christ and come out a sinner and be a sinner over here. You are dipped into Christ a sinner and you come out a saint. One who is now set apart unto God. That's why Paul never writes to the sinner saved by grace at any church in the Bible. He writes to the saints. Why? Because you get a name change based on the transaction, based on the transfer. Yeah. You're not a sinner, you're a saint. Amen. You are a sinner who has been saved by grace. No, that's not what you are. You are a saint that has been saved by grace. Amen. See, it's all about how you think yes, will control how you live. You tell me I'm a sinner by grace, I'm doing exactly what they think. I'm a sin and I claim grace. But if I'm a saint saved by grace, I got to live saintly based on grace. You see the difference? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some of you just been taught wrong. But today is your day of liberation. Now how are you going to live differently once you leave? In defense of the claim that believers have died to sin, Paul points out through salvation we are baptized or identified into Christ's, Jesus Christ and his death. As our mouths put it, Christ's death for sin becomes our death to sin. Christ's death for sin becomes our death to sin. Sin no longer has any reigning power over those who are in Christ. Sin can't run you. Unless you don't know. Or unless you don't have. Or unless you haven't been transferred. And the only way you haven't been transferred is you don't have the transaction of justification. You've never been declared righteous by God. You declared yourself righteous. Or some man declared you righteous. None of that will work for you if God doesn't validate it. Are you with me? But if God has truly done it, then it all looks like what he meant to accomplish. And that's why Peter says in 2 Peter chapter, chapter 1, we've looked at it, God has given you everything pertaining to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. He's enabled you to live this way. But you got to know it. You got to believe it. You got to walk in it by faith and not by sight. Because sometimes your act of sin will confuse you. See, all you got to do is repent. But if you got a habitual lifestyle, you better check yourself because you might be wrecking yourself. See, you're not sinlessly perfect. Just like you didn't sin perfectly when you was a sinner, we are not living righteously as perfectly right as we can be, but there's a difference between an act and a lifestyle. Amen. So I always want to know, and it's not that it doesn't bother me that people commit acts of sin. What bothers me is when you confront them about their sin, they don't want to deal with it. That's a problem. Because the passion is to live what? Holy. Holy, set apart. Not perfect. Nobody lives perfectly. But we ought to know you're moving in that direction. We ought to know that's your passion. We ought to know that's your intentional intent.
If we live in the spirit, let us also walk. And if you've been made alive by the spirit, then you ought to live like you've been made alive by the spirit. See, the way that we live the life is not by rules, it's not by license, it's by the Spirit. The Spirit gives you all the enabling power you need. It equips you with everything you need to live like God intended you to live. And grace is greater than sin. What Christ has done, don't forget the previous life, what Christ has done is greater than what the first Adam did. And what God provides is greater than what sin tore up. You got to believe that. That's an act of faith. So we have the affirmation, we what? Baptized into Christ, but we have the identification, we now begin to what? Take on the what? Image of Christ. What does God go? God's goal is to conform each of us to the image of Christ. Is that your identification? Can people see that? When people want to know who you are and what you're about, do you pull out your Christ identification card? Do you love like Christ? Do you forgive like Christ? Do you die to self like Christ? Do you witness like Christ? Do you make disciples like, that's your identification card. If he's conformed us to the image of Christ, then we got to reflect Christ's life. That's what 1 John said. Those who have been made alive in him are to walk like he walked. To live like he lived, to act like he acted, to love like he loved, to forgive like he forgave, to sacrifice like he sacrificed. See, it's not only what he died for, it's also what he did to you in dying for you. And God wants to conform each of you, each of us, every believer, to the image of Christ. And if you don't have that identification, we identify with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We die to sin. We die to self. We die to this world system and its values. We don't let this world put its makeup on us, he's going to say in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Conform to the image of Christ. Pastor, I'm ready for you this morning when, they, when his mother and them left and, and they were out days away and they came found out that he wasn't there and they went back to He said, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Hey, girl, come on, go out with us. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Hey, work. Don't go to church. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Hey, psh, psh, come over here and, and sing with us. Hey, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Oh, man, it's Sunday morning. I'm tired. I don't feel like going. Don't you know I must be about my father's business? Oh! See, we ain't about our father's business. So we let other business Amen. distract us. Amen. How you identify with Christ when you're not about his father's business? Yes, okay. All Christians, by placing faith in him, have been spiritually immersed into the person of Jesus Christ that is united and identified with him. Listen to these verses and we'll close with this. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You can't get living differently than Christ who lived when you're joined with him by one spirit. 1 Peter 3, 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us back to not the remover of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How is your conscience? How's your conscience before God? 1 John 1, 3. That which has been seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We now have fellowship with God. 
through Jesus Christ. But we'd rather fellowship with the world. Something's wrong. Somebody got an identification problem. Brothers and sisters, you are not what you were. And Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again to make it so. And the Holy Spirit was sent to live in you, to enable you, to empower you, to equip you, to be all that God sent his son to die to make you to be. You are liberated from habitual sin. Sin has been stripped of its dominating power, but you got to know it and act on it, whether you feel it, whether you understand it, whether you believe it, whether you're in the mood for it. I don't, have, I don't know much about phones. I don't know much about phones. I know how to make a phone call, I know how to receive a phone call. That's about it. That, that, that's basically me. My son does everything for my phone. If I need something changed, he the one. I hand it to my wife, I hand it to my daughter. Those three, they know phones. But I do know this about phones. There are certain features on the phone that are there but have to be enabled for them to work. See, in Adam, you were disabled. Somebody ain't praying with me. But when you identify with Jesus Christ, Christ enabled you by his death, burden, and resurrection to be all that God wanted you to be. But the problem with some of you is that you're on airplane mode. <laughs> See, when you get on the plane, if you fly to mother, they tell you to put your phone on airplane mode. Because they want, don't want the signal from the phone to be interfering with what's going on in the cockpit. Some of y'all ain't praying with me. See, some of y'all on worldly mode. And because you're so worldly, you can't get the communication you need from God, heavenly cockpit, and from the church that you need so that you can make the changes in direction and avoid the things that are coming your way that you can't see because you can't get in to all that you have in the cockpit of God's heavenly home. But make no bones about it. You've been enabled. What was turned off? In Adam, the first Adam, has been turned off in Christ. You are now enabled to live free of the dominating power of sin because Jesus died, was buried, and rose to make it so. There are no excuses, brothers and sisters. Either you, you don't experience it because you're not saved, because you didn't know, but now you know, or because you got sin in your life and you can't get the communication from heaven and the word of God you need to make the changes and directions that you need to be going in versus where you were going before Christ. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to show you which one it is. For those of you who are obeying, it's not because you're keeping rules, it's because you have learned to walk in the spear of the Spirit. And now you are experiencing the reality of your salvation. Where are you this morning? Where am I? Where are we as a church? We all need to get on the same frequency Amen. so that God can be glorified. Amen. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you so much for this privilege to stand before the people of God with the word of God. We ask, Father, that you have been working as we have been expounding upon this text. Thank you, Father, for the fact that Jesus not only died for our sins, but he also died to free us from the power of sin. And we no longer have to live under dominating influence because we no longer live in that sphere. We no longer live in that realm. We no longer live in...